Anna. Oh, look what's happened. Is that about right? Good. I called her Miss Muir. I knew her. I knew her as a friend. I knew her right until the very end. But I called her Miss Muir because we all did. She was sort of terrifying, but she was absolutely brilliant. I was working in Debenham and Freebody in the model suit department. It was my first job as a model in the 60s. It was about 1964. And I'd been with Lucy Clayton, and I'd been trained to walk about, but I was going to be a photographic model, so I didn't do, want to do the walking. But they said, your first job, Debenham and Freebody's model suit department, which was for women of 40 plus. I was 18. So I used to roll the skirts up high and just slink about like this. I didn't have to carry a number, but that's what I did. A wonderful French woman came up to me and said, her name was Lucienne Phillips. Those of you who might remember, she had a shop in Knightsbridge. She said, you should not be working here. You should be with Jean Muir. She works at Jen and Jen. Go and see her. So I did. I went to see Miss Muir, who was at that time not called Jean Muir. She was called Jane and Jane. 19 to 22, Great Portland Street, up four flights of stairs. And I got up there, and there was Miss Muir. Anybody who here can remember her or have seen a photograph of her, she never really changed during all the time I saw her. She had ruler straight, mousy hair, cut immaculately in a sort of sideways fringe like that. Very pale face, almost like a Piero sometimes, with very dark red or brown lipstick, smoky brown dark eyes. She had tiny, almost monkey-like, brilliant little slim fingers. She had a small frame. She was quite short. She was always immaculately dressed. And in London, she always wore navy blue. <laughs> How cool is that? Anyway, <laughs> she looked at me and she went, mm, mm. Those of, you who, those of you who've ever met her knew that she had this sort of vocal tick where she was going, mm, 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 mm. And she looked at me and she looked at my rather broad shoulders and went, mm, mm, because dresses were quite sloping. This, mm, mm, mm. And, she said, and she said, yes, you can come. You lose a bit of weight. So I did. I said, Limits biscuits, nobody can remember them. God, they were ghastly. Anyway, <laughs> I went on losing weight for Miss Muir until she said, you can stop getting thin now. So I knew I was just about right. This is what it was like. She had an office at the back where she did her drawings. Then there was a tiny, tiny, I wouldn't like to say a corridor, but it was about as long as that. Black curtains on each end and a chair, which was where I lived with a rail. And then there was a tiny showroom where people would come from America. They would come from Harvey Nichols. They would come from Vogue. They would come from anywhere to see the clothes that they wanted to use, take, or buy. And I would put them on in my little black chamber. And I always had on black, black tights, which were never dark enough, never opaque enough in those days. So we used to wear two pairs of tights to have Miss Muir wanted ink black legs and a little sort of black body stocking. Then I'd get into the things and I'd go out and I'd stand there quite close to the people who'd look at the garments and check them and see if they wanted them or not. Then I'd take them off and go back into my little room again. I only did it for three months, but the pay had leapt enormously because I was only paid eight pounds a week at Demenham and Freebody. And at Miss Muir's at Jane and Jane, it went up to 10. So this was money. Sometimes she would send me out, she'd say, uh, Joanna, darling, go to Fubert's place and get us something lovely for lunch. I've got Gerald, Geraldine Stutz coming in from Bendel's. I, li I lived off, I lived in a shared flat in Earl's Court with practically nothing to eat. I didn't know what good food was. You know, I'd go to Fubert's place and I'd say, could you get, give me some nice th things for lunch? I literally didn't know what nice things for lunch would be. How tragic. And I'd come back to something and miss me all get mm, 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 mm. Anyway. <laughs> she loved me. She loved me, and I loved her. I stopped working for her after three months, and I went out to become a photographic model and then to become an actress. But I never lost touch with her, and for her fashion shows, I would always go back and walk for Miss Muir at the fashion shows. By this time, she'd stopped being Jane and Jane, and she'd become Jean Muir, and she'd moved to 22 Bruton Street. It was on the first floor. It was beautiful. It was white. She loved white. She loved plainness, clear, sort of sophisticated. There was a big, big, big showroom. And on the days of the sales, um, of, of the shows, they would put out little tiny gold chairs, very traditional tiny gold chairs, crammed with people. And we were scruffed in the back. There were four of us who usually did them. Kelly, now gone. JJ, now gone. Roz, still alive, and me. And we'd have on our black tights, we'd have our hair scraped back like ballet dancers, red lips, nothing else. And we'd get into the clothes, all racked up very, very quickly, have to do small buttons and things like this, then slink out. Harry, 
Jean's husband would put on some jazz music because she loved cool, very cool things. Everybody would have a glass of champagne. And before we went on, she'd say, girls, girls, a champagne, champagne, glass of champagne. We'd have to have a glass of champagne before we went on. And then we'd walk, we'd just walk. And sometimes she'd say, Joanna, you must tell them about the jewellery. And I said, oh, don't make me speak. She said, you're going to be an actress, speak. So I would have to say the jewellery is made by, this is one of the things, a little beautiful oval bracelet. The jewellery she would design, or she would get young designers to design. She loved giving work to people. She loved the work of young people, and she loved Scotland. So she would employ the great knitters of the Outer Hebrides to make little lace cardigans and beautiful, tiny, delicate things, little hats, little scarves. She loved clothes. She loved, she loved the cloth. This is, this is actually a um, wool jersey, but she loved the heavy crepe jersey, she loved satins, she loved colours, even though she mostly dressed in navy blue. She was simply the most influential person I've ever met. She was meticulous about how things were made. So they were made in the showroom behind, the paper would be cut out to her drawings that she'd made, then the cloth toile would be made, then it would be pinned and put onto you, then it would be arranged and Miss Muir would look at you in the mirror. And she said, once she said to me, Jenna, what do you think about that? And I said, I think it's lovely. She said, well, the sleeve's all wrong, and just pulled it off, because I was too dim to see what was good or bad. A perfectionist. She used to have sails. The sails were something that you would just long for. It would, the message would come in, there would be a sail of Jean Muir, you know, either they were things you wanted to get rid of, or they were samples, and we would go along. And I tell you, the people who went along to the sails was Jill Bennett. It was... Um, it was Belle Schenkman. It was, she was one of the great lawyers of the day. It was Elizabeth Frink. I mean, it was fabulous people. We'd all scruffle along to the sails. We all had on slightly sad tights and sort of old grey bras. But we'd encourage each other. We'd say, oh, that looks divine on you. No, that looks divine. What do you think of this? Oh, I think this is divine. You look divine in that. I looked, oh, this is thrilling. We look divine in this. You look divine. And you'd think I'd only got enough money to buy two things. You'd come away with 12. You couldn't resist them. And you could always spot Jean your clothes across the room because somebody looked beautiful and Jean always wanted that. She wanted people to have her clothes on so that they became more beautiful, not that they were wearing a dress. Um, one of the most influential things about her was her character because in London, although she dressed in navy blue and her flat, she and Harry lived in one of those, is it called Albert Mansions, the ones behind the Albert Hall? Those enormous flats. It was pure white. It was white on the ground, white on the walls. All the furniture was that lovely Indian mirrored stuff and screens all painted white and the mirrored stuff, beautiful glinting, glinting. She had virtually no paintings. She had, well, she had some books, but the rooms were stark. This was her workplace. But Law Bottle Hall up in Northumberland, where she and Harry lived, was just the absolute opposite. She wore all kinds of tweeds and scarves and clothes and colours. The walls were stuffed with paintings, all kinds of paintings. There were throws and rugs and furniture and objects and statues. She had Henry Moore's. She had everything under the sun, a completely different, open, generous, colourful woman. She adored colour and she adored life. She took me when I was very young to see Judy Dench playing in Cabaret. And afterwards, we went to um, Danny LaRue's club. And as we came in, Danny went, hello, Jeannie, darling, lovely to see you here. She knew everybody. I can remember seeing Tommy Steele standing at the back of one of her shows. She had this extraordinary, all-encompassing generosity. And the shock when she died was extreme because none of us knew she was ill. That was one of the important things. She had breast cancer. She didn't tell anybody. Nobody knew about it. In the very last show she did, she decided she didn't want to have it like a show. She just wanted it to be a party. And we, the models, the people wearing her clothes, would just be there looking gorgeous in her clothes. Sometimes we'd slink off and rather uh, muddlingly appear in something completely different. <laughs> And people would just look at us and think, isn't life grand and isn't life great? And so when I was asked to open, do you open, display, reveal? Unveil. Unveil. Unveil the plaque to Miss Muir on 22 Bruton Street. I felt some huge circle being completed because this was one of my huge 
shining heroines. I don't have many, but Miss Muir was one of those. And it was a day with light drizzle in Bruton Street. And the plaque was up on the first floor, of course. And they said, up you go, out of the window. <laughs> Come on, Joanna, you've been an Avenger. Get up there. <laughs> And so lean out then the press going, Joanna, could you get a little bit closer to the plaque? We can't see you. And I was going, yes, yes, just, just coming, just coming. <laughs> Vertigo kicking in as I sort of leant out there like this, smiling. And there, assembled on the pavement, were the most adorable people representing Jean Muir. There were people from the showroom. There were some models. There were people who loved her clothes. And then passing by, curious people in cars looking at it, this extraordinary ceremony. And then suddenly, it was time to pull the cloth down, and there it was. And there it is forever. And the odd thing is, as I now drive past a London monument, English heritage, of recognized somebody who I could call a friend, because in the end I did call her Jean. Um, she was a friend, and I was alive, and she's history, and she's part of history, and I unveiled a part of history. And that, for me, is quite miraculous. I didn't look at you to see if you were giving me a five-minute warning, but I think I'm just going to stop now. Bless you. Thank you so much. And thank you, English Heritage.